we have some really special guests, uh, Tarla Nkrumah, who is the director of the Center for Gender Equity and Science and Technology, uh, Jackie Chadwick from the U of A School of Medicine. And on the line, we have Georgia Dunstan. Yes. And Georgia is one of our favorite, most favorite people in all the world. She is a woman of God. And uh, we're just honored to have you. Hello, everyone. It's good to see all of you. I was actually going to move if we, so we didn't look. There we go. Hi, Georgia. Hello. Finally, we see each other. Okay. Oh, my name is, as you said, Dr. Tara Nkrumah, and I am delighted to facilitate what I call a conversation. I am a social butterfly, so this is like in my element to be able to be in company with two phenomenal women, um, Dr. Jacqueline Chadwick and Dr. Georgia Dunstan. So I gave them homework. <laughs> I'm a teacher, and that's just what you do, right? And so the homework assignment was to ask them to introduce themselves, but I like to do things a little bit different. And while they could have read their bio of all of the things that they've done, it doesn't really connect you to them the way that I'm hoping what I've asked them to do will help you kind of connect to them. So if you will indulge, I've asked them to introduce themselves by sharing two artifacts. And I've given them the concept of one artifact representing love, and the other would be for science. And so that's what they're doing for you at this moment is introducing themselves under the theme of love and science. And so I'm going to invite Dr. Jacqueline Chadwick to introduce herself first. Thank you, Tara. When you told me about doing an artifact, you know, I connect artifact with archaeology. And I, you know, I said, mm -hmm. I'm not that old. I, I, didn't, I didn't really get it at first, but I did come up with something for you. So you said love and science. So when I thought about love, um, I thought immediately about my two Bichon dogs, my two little puppies, Jackson and Harry, and I love them. And they offer me unconditional love, even when I don't you know, I'm not there to take care of them. But the reason I thought about that was because I loved animals all my life and I wanted to be a veterinarian. So I went to a university that had a great veterinarian school and this was back in the 60s. So it's been a while. And I got there in my first week, I was so excited and I went in to talk to the people in the veterinary school. And they said, well, you know, we don't accept women into vet school. And so crushed, you know, my crushed dreams at that point. Well, I actually ended up just coming back, actually attended Arizona State University, stayed pre-vet for a while, and then became pre-med. So I ended up then going into medical school, which in retrospect was definitely all God's design, but it was all based on my love of animals and I continue to have that love of animals, but I know now that that love has been diverted, not just to animals, but also to people in my life. So on the science side of the equation, um, I thought about, obviously medicine uh, is imbued with science throughout, taking care of people, loving people. But about midway through my career as a family physician, I noticed that I had not been very well trained in some of those very difficult situations that arise, begin, beginning of life issues, end of life issues, um, scarcity of uh, allocation of scarce resources, which of course we saw this past year in spades. And I realized I really hadn't been trained very well in that. So they were very difficult questions. So I, I looked at this book, it's called Moral Dilemmas. And we all have them. We all face moral dilemmas in life, one sort or another. And it's not so much this book, but it really got to me about these dilemmas I was facing with my patients and that I didn't feel adequately prepared to help them the way I wanted to. So I ended up getting a degree in, in bioethics at that point in time. And that helped me not only understand better how to care for patients through those very difficult times, but also as I entered academic medicine, I was able then to transfer a lot of what I had learned to teaching medical students and teaching residents, which, 
turning around and passing on the experiences I've had and have dealt with to the next generation of physicians became very important to me. Thank you for that. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. You think about how God directs our lives, like we have a plan and career wise, you thought you were in this way, but then he took you, yes. And that's how he typically does. I know for myself, I had a love for science, but I thought medicine was the only thing that I could choose. And I'm a scientist by trade, and so I teach. But it's interesting, I was in church, and it was church that really taught me that I needed to be a teacher because I was asked to teach Sunday school, and I realized, whoa, I love teaching more than anything. And I didn't understand that I could transfer my love for teaching and science and bring them together. So thank you for sharing that. So Dr. Georgia Dunstan, it's a pleasure to see you. It was last year that we met at this same conference. And so I'm so excited to bring you back on. And I hope you did your homework. <laughs> yes, I, okay. I, I did my homework. And I will bring that up as I um, introduce. Actually, I was going to call for that, but that is my, that's my first assignment. And since it's already on the screen, it's okay. I'll leave it there. Uh, by way of introduction, I def um, by name, I'm Georgia M. Dunstan. <laughs> by birth, I'm the youngest daughter of four children, born in 1944 to Ulysses and Rosa Dunstan, African-American parents living in the southeastern region of the United States in the city of Norfolk, Virginia. I grew up in a Christian home where my environment and identity was shaped and influenced largely by going to church and going to school almost all of my life. And I would like to say by way of introduction at this point, with church and school so much of the environment of my life, I was a Sunday school teacher long before I became a college professor. So fast forward now to, uh, uh, to my presence here today at this conference on faith and science and participation in this session on science and love. As a way of introducing myself to the audience, I as Dr. Nkrumah Dara indicated, I was asked to bring two artifacts. And as she said, one that represents science and one that represents love. And I looked just to make sure I was on board with what the assignment was. I looked up artifact because very much uh, as, as um, Jackie, Jackie said, um, I kind of associated artifacts with archaeology, but I was very pleased when I looked up the term and I saw an artifact is an object that's made by a person, man or woman, but it often has cultural or historical relevance and its significance can be used to give information that reflects on the aspect of who a person is. And so, as an introduction, I say, that's perfect. And as a teacher, I'm very used to making slides and writing. So the two artifacts I have uh, will be shown, I'm, I says I'm on the screen. The first one is as a scroll where I'm unfolding a scroll that speaks first to the science of who I am. And the scroll begins by saying, the human genome declares the glory of God. And I am currently authoring, writing a book, and the title of the book is Soul Genomics. Soul is an acronym for science of unlimited life, because I want to present the genome as a material or physical manifestation of unlimited life. 
And I thought it's so appropriate that I called this soul genomics because I believe that one of the reasons that I have come to the science of genomics at this stage in human history is to bring a soul perspective on the science of the human genome. And I said, that's very fitting. As an African-American, we are often credited with being soulful people. We certainly are credited with having brought soul music, a type of music that comes and touches something from its end, and also soul food, that special taste that's unique. So as a professional human genome scientist, I thought it very appropriate that my, my book that I'm writing after now retiring from more than 40 years in academic medicine is Soul Genomics Song. And I can truly say that this conference from beginning to end has been in my mind a soulful declaration of a genomics song. And because place matters, I have no explanation for my career path in life, except to say that God purposed, planned, prepared, positioned, and put me in place for such a time as this, a time that I call the emergence of the third millennial global genome generation, a time benchmarked by the complete sequencing of the human genome, which has totally influenced our understanding of human identity, population diversity, and global community. My second artifact, which represents love, if um, that can come up on the screen now, is a picture of, um, uh, there is, uh, can you scroll up on that? Yes. This is a picture of my 2022 New Year's greeting card from Whole Genome Science Foundation, Inc., which is a 501c3 nonprofit that I founded in 2014, anticipating my retirement from academic medicine. I now serve as president and CEO of Whole Genome Science Foundation with a mission and a ministry to take the message, which I call reveal knowledge with the genome having been sequenced. I consider this now revealed knowledge of the word of the triune biblical creator God and father of the human genome family on earth. A message to America and the global community. Last point in terms of introduction, I will share with you my prayer for to God early in my life and now very much at the forefront of, um, of the whole genome science. Now you will go down to that last slide that you had first, yes. This was a New Year's greeting in which I shared with my mailing list that in 2022, we are looking forward. I am looking forward to bringing forth, as I said, the book Soul Genomics Song as a third millennial ministry and mission of taking the good news of good science advancing genome revelation knowledge 
on the kingdom of God within, on earth as it is in the cosmos. So I would hope that as we go into the conversation, I will have an opportunity to respond to questions and comments on um, soul genomics. Thank you very much, both of you, for your introductions. And I found it really interesting that the interpretation that the two of you had was different about what it meant on the homework assignment to bring artifacts. And so I say this to preference that that's leading me to the first question in our conversation, which is, I would like for you to define love in the context of your scientific professional work, because recognizing that you both had different interpretations, I don't want to assume that the understanding is the same. So I will turn to you first, um, Jackie, if you don't mind, to answer for me, how would you define love in the context of your work? as a scientist? Well, it's been said earlier today that we are made in the image of God. I believe we are made in the image of God and therefore we are, we have innate worth and dignity. And so everyone I see before me, whether it's a patient or a student or a colleague, I see as someone made in God, God's image and deserves my attention to that. And if that person is so valuable to God, why would I not treat that person the same way? And again, earlier, um, the two main parts of who we are, I believe Willie said it, is love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and love our neighbor as ourself. And Jesus boiled it down to those two commandments. So however I can demonstrate love, to the person in front of me by valuing them first, which means I listen to them. I want to um, find out what I can do to make them either healthy or successful, or maybe just a hug, maybe just listening to them uh, allows me to display what I feel is important in my love of that individual. I find that so important, the idea of looking at the individual in the image of God, like we are his image. And so that's really important to think about that. And so Georgia, how would you add to that in terms of your definition of love and your work as a scientist? Uh, okay, this is, this is a very interesting question for me because my whole career and path from uh, uh, through academia has been what I now can look in retrospect to a question that I posed to God as a child in Sunday school. The question that I posed was because I asked my pastors, I asked my teachers, I asked my mother, and quite honestly, one time my mother was so frustrated with me asking these questions. She said to me, George May, I do not know why God made you color, a colored girl. I don't know why God made you a girl. I don't know why he made you uh, who you are. I don't know why he gave you kinky hair. I don't know why he gave you, because I had questions. I grew up in the segregated South. South and I came up south, southern part of the US, and I came up during the time of uh, early school, during the time of desegregation. And there was a lot of attention on, uh, the, uh, on segregation and the resources and things that were available uh, uh, racially. And as a Sunday school, in Sunday school, I had learned from almost birth that we are all children of God and that God loves all of his children the same. And I would ask my elders, how did the differences that I was seeing in my experienced life reflect God's love for all of his children the same? It seemed through my eyes 
that God loves some of his children a little bit more. He has some pets, as we would call them in school. And I, that was a problem for me with what I was learning in Sunday school about God. And like I said, one time when I was asking my mother some of these questions, she instructed me, say, I tell you what, you ask God. And as an obedient child, I did very early. I asked God, do you love me the same as you do all your other children that are different from me? And what, how, how, how is your love shown? And I will fast forward to my slide that I gave you on love, uh, which was my desire as a professional human genome scientist, my desire to give voice to revelation knowledge, that's knowledge from God, that's encoded in the human genome. And I study as a science, the human genome, where variation, which is the characteristic of the genome sequence where variation is used for gene and self-discovery to tie love to my question. I can say to you that the science of human genome is a manifestation of God's love for each of his children, individually and collectively. The human genome is a gift of God's love, the knowledge of the human genome and science coming to unfold this human genome that we can literally read the book, if you will, of God's love encoded in the very nature of who we are with the genome being all about identity. As a science, the genome is about identity and inheritance. And in that regard, as I studied the science, I am just in love with the Bible verses that I learned as a child and that I studied as a Sunday school teacher that reveals God's love for me in a demonstrable way. And his love is reflected in my discovery of who I am. And as the scriptures say, we are magnificent creations. We are awesome in design. No less than the cosmos is the unfolding of this human genome that has turned science of biology into what we now call big data science. And when I was studying science and doing writing research grants, for example, I was told that competitive grants are, are hypothesis testing. And hypotheses represent the best guess that you have about reality based on the known facts that you put together in some kind of model. One of our speakers earlier today talked very eloquently about how we all look at life through models and we don't always appreciate the model that we are looking through impacting our, 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 our outcome and our data. The point I'm making is that through science, God has allowed us to sequence this human genome. The creator of this human genome has allowed us to unfold his 
knowledge on who we are, who we are, what we are, why we are, his purpose for us. And we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of his unfolding through the human genome, his purpose. And let me just close this sentence by saying, as I study the human genome, for me, the human genome is a natural path to supernatural identity, which is encoded in our genome. I don't know. I have a, it was a long answer to love. No, no, no. <laughs> And, and what I got was that you're so excited about the gene. If you guys didn't pick up on that, then I don't know where you were. <laughs> All right. So one of the things when we started out talking in Georgia, you mentioned how you overwhelmed your mother with questions all the time about your identity from every aspect of your life. And then also when I was asking about defining love, you talked about, um, Jackie, the idea that we're in the image. And so I want to kind of bring this back together and thinking about this idea that as we go along in life, we learn things. It's not obvious to us always that we are walking in a certain path that God has given us to walk. And so my question to you then is this idea of uh, assuming that the ability to love has to be learned, like all things in our life. I want to know who taught you, Jackie, who taught you how to demonstrate love, particularly in your profession? Because it's easy to love, I would assume, in our families and in different environments, but particularly in your work. How did you learn to demonstrate love? Well, I have to say I really did learn love from my family, from my parents. I'm the oldest child of three girls and um, very fortunate to have very loving Christian parents. So I, ha I learned it there. Uh, my, my road was a little bit different because although I wasn't in the very earliest phase of women in medicine, I was maybe in the second phase of women in medicine. So there weren't that many women in my medical school class and I was in a traditional educational environment where you were made to feel stupid at every possible point in time um, publicly it would be even better than privately and um, so that was a very deconstruction point of life for me that I then had to come out the other side and reconstruct myself and as I went into residency then, the city that I ended up doing my residency in, there were only two women physicians in the entire city. So I kept looking for a mentor, looking for someone that I could talk to about these issues or model myself after. And unfortunately, I'm sure it was more a fault on me than anyone else, but I just never found that kind of relationship with anyone as a mentor. So what I decided to do was just to concentrate on my relationship with Christ. My relationship, I think, grew, it suffered in medical school as I was going through that difficult time. But then when I came out the other side, I really found that Christ was my mentor and scripture, the Bible became the core of where I learned more about how to act, how to behave, how to love. And the choices I made, and I made a lot of very bad choices along the way, but one of the good choices I made, especially in residency, in, a, in an environment where there weren't many people that, that I felt were my friends or my role models, was to just be myself and to always take the high road and to never try to prove my point. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't obstinate about it. I didn't, I wasn't a flaming feminist necessarily. And that was a big thing back then, which way you went as a woman in science or a woman in medicine. And I just did the best I could, tried to be the best doctor I could be. Um, I offered to um, do more ER call than other people in when I went into private practice. Um, I would often be called on in the middle of the night for cases that, that other doctors would not take. 
Um, I offered to first assist on surgeries in the middle of the night when they couldn't get an assistant. It was just too hard. And so I think making myself more of a, I'm here to serve, I'm here to help, was a way that, that became very helpful to me in my career, but that wasn't the reason I did it. I really did it because I felt that that was what Christ wanted me to do. Georgia, do you mind answering? How, how did you learn to demonstrate love in your profession? Who taught you that? <laughs> I, um, if I might, I'd like to go back and just comment on my definition of love in terms of, um, of who taught it to me, okay? Because I heard uh, um, the statement made this morning that this session on love was agape love. Now that was the first time I had heard agape used as the descriptive for love because my first thinking when it was just science and love was appreciating all the different ways one might define love. So I'm now interpreting your question, who taught me agape love? Okay. And, uh, and, and just to make sure on the same page with agape love is I, define agape love as the very nature of God. Again, my reference book for all of my science is the Bible as the word of God. And the Bible says God is love. Love equals God. <laughs> uh, so then, Love is encoded in the very structure of the DNA that forms our genome. And I would say, who taught me love? <laughs> now, this is going to sound very churchy, but it's, it, it is my answer. The Holy Spirit who is the one who I look to, to teach me God's word. That's why I say revelation knowledge. I look at the human genome and I ask for revelation knowledge. So revelation knowledge of God is about the nature of God, which is love. And my teacher of Love as my nature being made in the image of God by God himself. Uh, I look to the Holy Spirit to teach me how to express my inheritance as love. So I, I didn't want to skirt the question but that is my teacher, my educator. Now, I have had many people, particularly my uh, professors who directed me in my work, who have shown selfless, which is, by the way, God, agape being selfless love, or other people directed love. And so I have had many mentors along my path who have been instrumental in pointing me to pursue my questions about God, to pursue my love of the human genome as God's answer to my question. And in that regard, they're encouraging me to pursue my inherited nature and then build a science, tell a story, share a life and demonstrate this truth in how I live. I would credit as many who have pointed me to look within for 
the kingdom of God, which is in each of us. Well said, thank you for that. Um, I could go on, but I do want to honor that there are questions coming in from the audience, and so I do want to respectfully address some of those questions, and one is for you, Dr. Chadwick. I'll start with, it asks, how has your understanding of love aided you in dealing with the kind of dilemmas you had to face in medicine? That's a great question. Um, I don't think I could face them without expressing it through love. Um, they're just too hard. They're too thorny. Uh, so sitting at the bedside of a dying patient, which I have done many times, um, when I did, back when I did house calls, um, actually going to the home, I remember one very poignantly sitting as the man, the husband of the family um, died, and then staying there with the family during their grief waiting for the mortuary to come and take away the body. That, that's, a, that's holy ground. Uh, that is a time that you're sharing the deepest of emotions. And to be able to do that through the eyes of love and compassion and empathy uh, was the only way, just my presence, my being there. I didn't have any answers. I didn't have any cure. I didn't have anything other than my presence to be there or sitting in, an, in my office, uh, at one point I'll give one other example, a patient I'd had for quite a long time, uh, a woman in her, I would say mid thirties, and she had had a lifelong problem with abdominal pain and um, had multiple imaging studies, every test in the book that you could think of. She even had exploratory surgery to find out, is there anything we can find in there? She had hysterectomy, she had everything, and she continued to have severe abdominal pain. So, you know, it's frustrating for a physician, obviously frustrating for the poor lady. So at the end of this one particular visit, again, someone I had known for a while, um, she had talked about the pain, excruciating pain she's in, and we talked, and I was getting ready to leave, and something held me back. And I turned around, and it was as if I was looking into her soul. And I said, there's something else you're not telling me. What's going on? And then she described horrible sexual abuse she'd had as a child. And that was a source of her pain, and no one had ever asked her about it. She'd never told anybody before about it. And we obviously had a significant discussion after that. And we were able to begin addressing some of those things that were weighing so heavily on her and manifesting itself as this abdominal pain. So those are instances where, um, and I'm sure that was the Holy Spirit stopping me in my tracks before I left again. Um, but having that sense of presence and then having the sense of um, being open to the guiding of the Holy Spirit, the guiding uh, influence of opening those kind of doors that you never know what will walk through. So those are just two instances where uh, love manifests itself in very unusual ways, just by being open to it. Thank you for that. Dr. Dunstan, this question is for you from the audience. They are wondering, are you fully satisfied with the answers you have received to the questions you asked as a child? And are any yet unanswered? Mm. That really is a great question. And I do appreciate that. Uh, the short answer to that is yes, I am fully satisfied with the knowledge that the Holy Spirit is revealing to me about God's love for me, for me, Georgia M. Dustin, a little black girl growing up in the segregated South. Who, who, who went through school, my work with working parents, who went through school from preschool through the PhD to the postdoctoral with the steps appearing and as I got 
as I made each step in pursuit of getting answers to the questions where people led me ultimately to human genetics is the science that really deals with getting as much as science can give you on the answer to my question. So the answer to my question is, again, I love to use as my context, not hypothesis testing, but truth affirming. So the methodology of science in writing a grant, you want to develop, as I said, a model which is based on known facts and hypothesis testing are stronger kinds of question to pursue. But now that we have the whole genome and we have the creator's information on the human mechanism, how it comes into being, how it functions, and we're just scratching the surface. After the sequence in the genome, the next front that we are dealing with now coming from the brain initiative, which is now combining the knowledge of our thinking uh, with our physical being. And I say that to say, the answer to my question is the Bible verse, quite honestly. For God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So both as a Christian and as a human genome scientist, the love of God for me is being addressed and answered and my question daily as he blesses me to search out answers about his love that's encoded in my very nature, that's encoded in my identity, that's encoded in my inheritance, that's encoded in helping me to move from the natural to the supernatural being that I am when I identify myself with Christ in me. And so that's the coming together for me of both my faith as a Christian and my training as a scientist where I study who am I and this knowledge of the human genome answers the question. And it is, an, it is the ultimate gift of love, of God's love to me. And in this age that we can call personalized medicine, the genome brought to us personalized identity, personalized presence, of God within us as one. So yes, everything I learned about the genome and I can root it in scripture, in the word. That's the joy that I have of being a voice for revelation knowledge on the nature of God, which is love and the creation of God, which is the human genome, which gives expression to each one of us. You know, I came here with expectations that have gone way beyond what I expected to have. You both have blessed me from this conversation, and I can't thank you enough for the privilege to sit here and to have the opportunity to be in conversation with you both. And so thank you for sharing your life. Thank you for indulging in me with the homework assignment. You both get an A, um, so I appreciate that. <laughs>